For our second essay, we'll be responding to the 2004 FRQ Q2, which is a letter from Lord Chesterfield to his son. This video seeks to review the rhetorical analysis text prior to the writing of the essay. Okay, here we go. So this is the text itself, and this is the prompt up here. I want you to remember we are looking at the 2004 FRQ. Now, the prompt itself begins, The passage below is an excerpt from a letter written by the 18th century author Lord Chesterfield to his young son who is traveling far from home. Read the passage carefully, then in a well-written essay, analyze how the rhetorical strategies that Chesterfield uses reveal his own values. Now, before you begin writing about a text, you have to break down the prompt. The prompt will give you a lot of information that you need prior to entering the reading of the text. If you enter the reading of the text without understanding something, then you're going in blind. You need to be able to pick up as much information from the prompt and use that information to anticipate what's going to happen in the text. So... Here are some things that I can I can gather from the prompt. Number one is a letter. So I already know that I have to be thinking about certain things when writing about a letter. Number two, I know that it's a letter from father to a son. And I know that the son is traveling away from home and that the father wants to reveal his own values. That tells me, put together, that this letter is meant to be one of guidance of sorts. So I can anticipate this, this uh, tone, perhaps, throughout the letter. So here are some things to think about or to remember when writing about letters. Number one, pathos, very important. These are personal messages between people across time who have a shared history. So you should focus on the tone because the tone will be very important. Now this tone will not always be explicit because there's hidden context. So you have to be aware that some things aren't said directly in the letter, that there's a lot of implicit meaning, a lot of conversations prior to that letter and after that letter that we will not be privy to. So you have to consider that this is coming out of from, from somewhere, right? It's like a, a snippet in a conversation. So you have to demonstrate that you understand the intended audience and that you're not the intended audience. The intended audience is always most precisely in this kind of text, the letter, somebody else, right? These people were not writing a letter considering that some kid would be reading it for an AP Lang exam. They were writing a letter that was private. So you have to understand the context of that privacy. So consider the time period, consider what's being said and what's not being said. Consider the beliefs and the values of the people from whence the letter comes. Consider those things as you write in response to a letter. All right, now, what is the purpose of the text? I, I always advise that as you're reading the text, try to pick out a line that tells you the purpose. Usually it's there, maybe not always, but for the most part it is. Most people would like want to reveal their purpose since they are trying to communicate to an audience so here it is let my experience supply your want of it let me guide you let me offer you experience let me offer you what you don't have right you are young i am old let me save you some trouble that's the basic purpose of the text now what we're doing here is what is called pass uh college board calls it soaps now they call it a space cat i think it doesn't matter the point is that you want to identify the purpose the audience the speaker and the situation now, the purpose we can say as we're reading the letter, and I can tell you this because I've read it and I've already analyzed it, it is uh, Chesterfield is seeking to offer guidance to his traveling son while reminding him of the expectations placed upon him. This is very important because there is a dual tone, and letters have a lot of that. There are transitions in tone in letters, especially from a father to a son or a parent, parental unit uh, to, to, to uh, a child. So you have to remember that there are transitioning tones here, and you should be aware of those as you're writing them, writing about them. The audience is Chesterfield's son, right? This is true, but the emphasis here is son, uh, youth, um, inexperienced, uh, traveling away, right? So this is this is important. Also, son in the sense of the the person who who is going to make you look a certain way, right? It's 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 also about status and about um family protecting the family name so the speaker here most clearly is chesterfield but he is an educated important man he wants to inculcate values in his son he's a father but he's also taking the role of a teacher and he's a man these are all important things in the letter so we have to consider the speaker not only as the guy who wrote it but what kind of guy is the guy who wrote it so the situation here is uh, a young son who's traveling, a father whose status and values he aims to protect by 
protecting his son because he wants to protect his own values as well and a boy that he wants to grow into a man so there are a lot of things to consider as we go now okay so we're going to get into it and we're going to begin by section the first section covers lines 1 through 12. i'm dividing it based on what i see is the first unit of thought and then the second unit of thought because here paragraphs don't really uh, count so he says though i employ so much of my time in writing to you i confess that i've often my doubts whether it is to any purpose i know how unwelcome advice generally is i know that those who want it most follow at least i know that those that the advice of parents more particularly is ascribed to moroseness and the imperiousness and the garrulity of old age right so he begins chesterfield by acknowledging the way that children look at their parents right so he 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 knows that the advice of parents is usually perceived as condescending, old-fashioned, right? But he ends that section, I flatter myself that as for your reason, though too young, strong enough to enable you both to judge and receive plain truths, right? So I know that it's, it can be condescending and old-fashioned, but I trust that you will listen to me and discern that what I'm saying is truthful and applicable, right? So that's the first section of his letter essentially what this section does is it anticipates counterclaims and biases think about it what what uh, chesterfield is doing here is a logical appeal he wants to dis disarm his son with concessions that prime him prime the son to chesterfield's later assertions well what do i mean well think about what he's doing he says that i know that um advice of old old age is often seen this way and i know it can be unwelcomed and i know it can be morose and imperious right i know that but so this anaphora allows him to to get his son to buy in right he anticipates his son's uh counter if he begins with listen i need you to remember this and i need you to think about that the son might roll his eyes so to say but uh, but what he what he says here is listen i know that you don't want to hear it now, immediately, because he's tapping into the, the counter, he's anticipating the counter, his son is now now more primed to, to understand or to hear his father because he knows his father understands that he doesn't really want to hear it, right? So this kind of a, a parallel, what he's doing is that he's paralleling the traits of the old, the conceptions of the old. And by doing so, he is deflecting the objections that the son may, may have to receiving his father's advice, right? Now, this logical appeal is very interesting because it comes in pairs. It's a concession and then an assertion, which happens in section two. There's a lot of, listen, I know you don't want to hear it. Listen, I know this, I know that. But, and then he shifts there to, the, to another focus, right? So this is a very important portion of the text because right from the beginning, he anticipates his son's uh, concerns and then deflates them and primes them for what he's about to say. So here's the second section where he actually makes his assertions. Now, a lot of the second section is about ethical appeals, right? Personal connection. Look at what he says here. Let's begin with, uh, I can have no interest but yours in the advice that I give you, and that consequently you will at least weigh and consider it well, in which case some of it will, I hope, have its effect do not think that I mean to dictate as a parent. I only mean to advise as a friend, as an indulgent one too. Do not apprehend that I mean to check your pleasures. I only desire to be a guide, not a censor. Let my experience supply your want of it and clear your way in the progress of your youth of the thorns and briars which uh, scratched me. Okay, so this second section, what is happening here? What, uh, what Chesterfield is doing is he's controlling his ethos. He says, do not think that I mean to dictate as a parent. I mean to advise as a friend. I don't mean to check your pleasures. I want to be a guide, not a censor. So he is controlling his his ethos with antithesis. Now, how is he controlling? Why is he controlling his ethos? He's controlling his ethos because he gets to paint himself in the way he wants to be seen, right? If the son is listening to all this advice and he says, "Oh, like he's going to tell me not to do this and not to do that," but but if, if the father says, "No, no, no, listen, listen." I am not this, I am that. I am not doing this, I am doing this, right? By doing by doing this this pattern, right, uh, of antithetical writing, what, what Chesterfield is doing is he is controlling the way he is seen, controlling his ethos very clearly in the line up here. 
I have no interest but yours in the advice that I give you, right? And later on, there is even more control when he gives them a metaphor, a metaphor of being lost in the thick of the forest, which alludes to the difficult path of adulthood. He says, let me, let my experience clear your way in the progress of your youth of those thorns and briars which scratched me and disfigured me in the course of mine. So altogether, what we're looking at here is we're looking at a metaphor that uh, allows the father to make a personal connection with his son of his own personal struggles in his life, right? And this metaphor is meant to be a cautionary tale to his son, which implores him to learn from his father's mistake before committing the same ones. So this is something, yet again, that that uh, that warms the, the son to the father, because now it isn't there isn't this dichotomous difference. There isn't this uh, higher status father, right, beaming down his advice on the son. Instead, it's, it's a kind of friendly advice. Maybe not friend in the sense of his buddy, but definitely a friendly advice about avoiding stupid mistakes, right, that can create permanent uh, problems. So essentially, the, the overview of Section 2, what's happening here is he reminds his son that he was also young, right? And he, too, wanted adventure. And he knows that at some point he also didn't want to listen to his father. But it's important that he listens because he wants his best, hit the best for, for his son, right? And he wants to avoid the thorns and the briars of these experiences. So by comparing the consequences of his experiences, Chesterfield creates a self-explanatory metaphor that illustrates how defiance of authority and disregard of education leads to regrettable outcomes that can affect an individual negatively. So, this is the moment in line 25 where the tone shifts. Uh, it's difficult to, to articulate, but you want to say that the shift is from a more um, understanding and warm to a more uh, rigorous, demanding right? There's an awareness of, there are expectations of you. So I do not, def therefore, as much as hint to you how absolutely dependent you are upon me and that you have, that you neither have nor can have a shilling in the world and then so on and so forth. So here's where he begins to shift the tone from, I haven't even mentioned that you depend complete, completely on me and that you can't, you know, do things without me and that you need me because I am your father. So here he starts shifting in the tone. And it's important because the first section essentially gets the son ready to listen. And now the 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 more strong the stronger advice comes in. So essentially, what we always want to do is break the text. I like to break it in this case at lines 25, where I can dedicate the body one of my essay to the first section. And then after I, I do that, I can dedicate the second portion of the text to body two. Now, there may other there may be other ways to separate this text, but this is the way I would be breaking it. Now, I'm not going to do the entire text because my students will be writing about this essay, but I'm doing the first portion to give them a heads up, and that way they can write the second uh, portion or rather uh, complete the analysis and write the essay about the entire uh, text. So, thank you for watching. That's it.